Um, I remember Annie Nunnally's uh, interview with uh, Udar. Um, Udar was a, a, a long-term ashramite, um, and his name was Udar Pinto. Anyway, um, there's an in her interview with him, he mentions that the mother once told him he was doing his sadhana somehow incorrectly or not completely. And she said, you should brush your teeth with me. Mm -hmm. So every little act, you know, every little minute practical thing can be offered. And we know from the synthesis that Sri Aurobindo says, you know, you can start mechanically. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. if you don't have full sincerity, mm -hmm. because you will develop that as the relationship develops. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's my take on it in brief. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you for this. Yeah, uh, the, it's uh, truly speaking, yes, it's the most beautiful part of all the relations with the mother that she wanted us to always speak to her everything, bring her everything, whatever we have. And not only the best thing what we can do or offer, but our worst things also. And she speaks about this, bring your, you know, things which you don't want anybody to know you are ashamed of you you are hiding it somewhere you know and only those who are the the true children of the divine of the mother they dare to bring that and offer her for transformation they are not afraid of of their shortcomings of their incapacities of their falsehoods and uh, so isn't that the prakriti that doesn't allow us to do the offering that we like to offer like mentally or in heart we think but many times prakriti is the is the hindrance there you know prakriti is a big word you know it's like uh, including yeah. all the movements in nature mm, okay. yeah in a way that if that is the right answer <laughs> it is the <laughs> prakriti who is not totally aware yet or tries to withhold to her own movements if we speak philosophically she enjoys her own creativity as it were mm -hmm. or her own path to discover the truth and wants to insist on that path um, which is the case basically and uh, Shobindo says that um, that Purusha has to be we have to develop that awareness of the witness within us uh, and his power of will uh, which is totally indispensable for this yoga and that power of will may decide what movement of prakriti is to be accepted and which is to be rejected so and then when that power is applied of the witness that sanction then pr then prakriti cannot but accept it yeah even if she wants to do it, because she already is in a particular groove or a particular habit, especially habit, you know? and everything flows in one way, the stream of energy, we know how it is, we know how to fight it. Even our difficulties, notice, whenever we bring some difficulties for transformation to the mother, I did this many times, and I must tell you this, uh, this is really marvelous how it doesn't work <laughs> this is the marvelous <laughs> part you offer it and then and then you see it is taken away from you that bad habit thought of craving or this or that desire and then you start missing it after some time <laughs> you want it back as it were you go back to your pro your problems because you want to deal with them that gives you a self-identity of some kind i would rather fight with my weaknesses and feel myself being alive than i become something i am not aware of yet <laughs> this is the problem of prakriti so you put it very rightly that's how prakriti uh, actually operates within us. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Vladimir? Yes. Uh, how does the uh, mother talk uh, of surrender? 
how does that fit in with the movement of sacrifice? Well, it's ongoing discussion, but the difference between surrender and sacrifice, yes. Um, in my view, in my opinion, and correct me if I am wrong, you read Sri Aurobindo as well as I did, I do not see the difference. But uh, the word sacrifice is used in a traditional way in the, in the religious setting, has a particular connotation which they do not uh, imply in using it. Shobindo, I put this quotation onto our um, forum, you remember how Shobindo speaks of sacrifice, so beautiful. It's not a mutilation, it's an enlargement yeah. of the spirit. So, okay. <laughs> It's just the opposite to that what people think of sacrifice because because the sacrifice has two parts. One part is our unregenerated being which has to be changed, which we offer for, for transformation. And when we offer it, that being wants to actually still to endure and to continue and feels that we are violating its right to be so to say. And it is very true. Somewhere in Savitri Shirobindo says, everything what was once has right to be. Can you imagine? Anything which was once experienced has a right to be and to continue. And that is the, the, the power of the spirit which is manifesting itself in this world. Only it is misplaced and this misplacement creates all the difficulties. Now I want to put it into the dharmic placement, into proper dynamic truth placement. And when I do it, I... I... Um, deprive it of, of all of its, you know, powers and privileges yeah. and preferences and likings and dislikings. And it loses its very, very energy, which was that very life force. Now it feels like being deprived of, of life when I offer it. It suffers. So from here we have the idea of suffering um, because one part, egoistic part, suffers the transformation but the soul part rejoices and expands. So if we identify ourselves with the inner part, with that which expands and grows in delight, then there is no suffering at all, ever, never, in any mutilation so-called of the outer egoistic being, there would be only a delight. And that's what Mother says about surrendering. I am ready to give my, my, the whole Every life, part. my body, yes, all part, drop by drop of my blood if necessary. Yeah. Pure delight, delight, not suffering. Why? Because she is identified with that movement which which is expanding and growing. And when the divine is growing, where is suffering? There is no suffering. It's more the concept of liberation, feeling of liberation. Yes, everything is being liberated. Everything is f f being found, was lost and now found finally. The truth of the being is found in minutest detail. It doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be big. It can be a very small thing, but it is properly done. And it gets the divine quality and it's a pure delight. Uh, yeah. Vladimir, um, can't we say uh, in one perspective that uh, the avatars, the mother and Shirobinda also uh, made the sacrifice of taking a body and identifying with our suffering and uh, transforming it. I mean, it was not only delight, it was, there was a lot of pain, wasn't there, in Mother's mm -hmm. and Shirobindo's work. I mean, they, I know, for example, Shirobindo uh, says that he, ha he had suffered. Somebody said, you know, you're the, you're the avatar, you don't suffer like we do. And he said, I have suffered more than anybody, any human could possibly bear. And yeah. in Mother's, in the agenda, Mother's talking about her body suffering. Uh, extremely from being identified with all the people suffering. So I think, is that, could that be considered a sacrifice? Yeah, yeah. 
And Shubindu says, you are absolutely right, I have 1001 wound, yeah, which, is, which is difficult to heal, because these are the wounds coming from the blows of Asuras, not just any other blow. So, um, well, uh, I'm speaking in their language, yes, uh, so to mm. say. Of course, there will be there will be transformation of our being which is not ready to be transformed yet. Maybe it's that speedy transformation which creates a lot of interaction with this unregenerated context in which we live. And I'm, I'm sure that these are not only our forces, not only our being which is coming to fight for its right to be, but all other subconscious forces. And that's where mother had to to reconsider uh, actually the transformation. She was believing, and we, everybody in ashram believed that uh, the immortality is possible within one body. Until she actually discovered that the resistance becomes uh, subconscious and in conscient resistance everything comes to resist if when this ideal is being promoted or this force is acting upon so she had to meet not only her own resistance in her own body but the whole subconscious level of the whole nature yeah from the beginning of time came resisting so in a way this is a bigger battle and of course, Sri Aurobindo was part of that battle, and that's why he had to leave his body. That is the greatest sacrifice he made. Again, a sacrifice. You see, there are many meanings of this word, it seems. Yeah? He gave his life. For what? Just to remove the shadow which rose from inconscient. And shadow rose because they speeded up the evolution. Now, he considered this to be his responsibility. So to take a shadow away from the humanity. And he gave his life for others. Incredible. Mother says nobody did such a great sacrifice ever. If I can touch base with what um, Robert said, you know, about them taking all the pain. So when I was growing up in ashram under her, I have expressed to a few people that um, I never felt unhappy, never. Uh, from morning till night, there was nothing because I always feel and felt that she was taking and making us feel that way. She was taking all the pain from, we were 200 children that time in the school. And uh, she must, must be doing something to keep us in her womb, in her envelope. And we were sort of wrapped up in her that I never felt that I was unhappy as a child, you know, as growing up, you know. So um, I sort of agree with Robert that, yeah, they have, they must have taken a lot of pain from us, you know, for us, for us. Mm. It reminds but, me also a little bit of Jesus, not to mention Jesus in vain. Right, right, right. Yeah, you know, that... Um, that he took on him, onto himself the sufferings of others. Um, most probably we do not know the full depth of that you know, cup of suffering, definitely. what it means really for the divine. That's why she says the divine is being sacrificed here, not otherwise, not other way around. By the way, you will find this in the, in the language. It's very beautiful in Sanskrit language which we usually, we don't pay attention to this, but the root yaj, to sacrifice, is used in a, with the direct object, uh, like uh, Vishnum yajati, he sacrifices literally Vishnu. And it means, it is translated always, he sacrifices to Vishnu. But it is a direct object. 
he sacrifices Vishnu for the king, dative case, by the milk, with the help of milk or instrument, whatever he is being sacrificed is instrumental, and who, whose consciousness, and I understand this now very well, that the, the divine power is being sacrificed. It is brought down into our narrow atmosphere. It is dragged down to do the work and to, uh, and that is done by Agni. Agni is the divine will, the summoner of the gods. He summons them and they cannot but answer. Yeah? They cannot refuse his call. They must answer to his uh, aspiration, that aspiration in the heart and the answer from above, as it were. So these relations of the call and the answer, so the, the higher power comes down to this call from within. And that is being sacrificed, the divine is sacrificed here. And that's, we think that we are deprived of some kind of, you know, it's not so. If the sacrifice is taking place, of course, if the real change is taking place, if it is just a game of some kind of, you know, religious cult or something, you do it every day, that is something else. But if we ch feel the change, then of course the Divine Presence is here, and that means it is already settled somewhere within our consciousness. It acts already upon us. We think differently, we feel differently. We changed. And that was the sacrifice of that higher power. It makes sense. And here when we read the Rigveda, I wanted to come to the Rigveda and see the Purusha sacrifice. Would you like to see this? Uh, the hymn? Yes. From the Rigveda? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, there are few things here which are interesting to examine. Is the Purusha sacrifice is a well-known hymn? Sahasra Shirsha Purusha Sahasraksha Sahasrapat. And notice the Rishi is Narayana. The devata is Purusha. <laughs> um, it's tenth mandala, closer to our time. So the Purusha, the Lord with thousand heads, with thousand eyes and thousand legs. Why thousand? Thousand is a, is a number of infinity. Yeah? His powers, arms are everywhere. His heads are everywhere, pervading the whole space. His eyes, his feet. Feet means his m movement yeah? everywhere. Sabhumim Vishvato Vritva Atyatishthad Dashangulam and having covered the earth from all sides, Vishvatah, he has arisen over ten angulas. Now, this is a mystic language, ten angulas, ten fingers. Sometimes they measure by fingers um, the breath, the depth of breath in pranayama. But uh, I think these ten angulas are ten rays, the shagva rishis, which we mentioned before, yes? ten levels of consciousness. So starting from the most material and ending with over mental consciousness. So he stood up uh, or uh, has arisen over the ten uh, angulas, over the ten levels, over the over mental, from the material beyond over mental consciousness. I, I can speak on this more, but this is not the topic of today, so I will just go ahead. Purusha evedam sarvam yad bhutam yad chabhaviyam utam ritatvas yeshanah. Yat anne nati rohati. This is beautiful. The, for Purusha is indeed all this. What was or will be the Lord of immortality, which overgrows by material manifestation. Annena, by the Anna, he atirohati, he grows bigger than he was. 
And this is the God come down and greater by the fall, the line from Savitri. You remember um, uh, uh, Aravinda Basel speaking on this topic in, uh, in uh, Savitri Bhavan. Maybe some of you remember his talk. I was there making uh, recordings of him <laughs> that time. It's, a, it's really this. How come that the, the God who came down becomes greater by the fall? He overgrows himself through material manifestation. It is that what Mother says, that he acquires the additional ananda, ananda of unity, which he didn't have. Through manifestation, he multiplies his infinite ananda of identity through unity. This is something uh, interesting to think of. And it goes on and on. Maybe I will not read everything, but this is really interesting to read. Um, Oh, this is the mystical part. Tasmat virata jayata virajo adhi purushach. She been to comment on it in the life divine. And so on. I want to come to the, to the seasons. Here are the seasons. Yat purushena havisha deva yajnya matanvata. Uh, the sacrifice which the gods spread with Purusha as an offering. So Purusha was an offering. Purusha still is an offering by the gods. Who are the gods? The gods are his own powers. And that's what Sri Aurobindo describes. Adhidaiva is a, about Purusha. Purusha has his devatas. His devatas are seeing, hearing, speaking, thinking. These are his faculties of consciousness. And by them, he, the soul, was sacrificed here. We can see it in Aitareya, when we will come in Aitareya in a minute. To Aitareya, we will read exactly this. So, Vasanta Asyasid Ajyam. So, the spring became an oblation, summer a fuel, and autumn an offering. So, the whole year was spread in such a way that it is one process of dynamic manifestation of one soul, Purusha, universal soul. Tam Yajnam Barhishi Praukshan Purusham Jatam Agratach. Tena deva ayajanta sadhi akhrishayashaye. That Purusha born in the beginning, they consecrated on the sacrificial grass as yajna. Sacrificial grass, we have to also comment. It is that vastness, extension, extension of space. They, they put him within that extension or spread him there. As, as uh, Taitiriya would say, there's, uh, as uh, Vijnanam Yajnam Tanute, they spread Vijnanam as sacrifice, Karmani Tanute Bija, and they spread all the karmas, the gods, the faculties of Purusha. Tena Devach Ayajanta, by him the gods have sacrificed. Sadhiyach, Sadhiyach, the ancient beings similar to gods. The class of the gods we cannot even comment on because we do not know who are, who they are. Rishayashaye and all the rishis, rishis, sadhyas and gods, all the faculties of Purusha sacrificed by him, with him as the offering. Tasmat yajnat, it goes on, from that sacrifice, what came into being, everything came into being. Uh, all the Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajur Veda, all the meters, all the verses were born. From that, uh, the horses, the cows, the um, sheep, and um, uh, from that sacrifice totally, Yat Purusham vi adadhuh, when they distributed the Purusha, how many parts did they arrange? Katidha vi akalpayan, mukham kim asya, kao bahu, kao uru, pada uchiete. What did his mouth become? Uh, his hands, his thighs, his legs. 
Brahmano asya mukham asit. Brahmano asya mukham asit. Bahu rajaniyah kritah. And here it comes. Brahmana became his mouth. The hands were made rajanya, the kshatriya. What was the thighs or the torso became vaishya. From the feet Shudra was born. These are the four major varnas about which Sri Krishna will speak in this chapter which we will read today. Chapter 4, Chaturvarnyam, he created this. And what is this Chaturvarnya? It is these four powers of the mother, the power of knowledge, the power of action, yes, the power of delight, or the consciousness of delight and the power of action or perfection. So these are the Maheshwari, Mahakali, Mahalakshmi and Mahasarasvati. Here they are. The transcendental Sat, Chit, Ananda and Vijnana. They are the powers with which Purusha brought with his with him being sacrificed by his own faculties. And so on and so forth. I want to come to the to the end faster because I want to read through the Aitareya. Saptasya asan paridhayach trich sapta samidhah kritah devayad yajnam tanvana abandhan purusham pashum. Seven fences were his. What are these seven fences? Seven selves. Anna Maya Purusha, Prana Maya Purusha, Mano Maya Purusha, Vijnana Maya Purusha, Ananda Maya Purusha, Chaitanya Purusha, Sat Purusha. These are the fences or the divisions, if you will, you know, of the one consciousness. Three times seven, the fuel was arranged. This is amazing. Three times seven, twenty-one. When the gods sacrificing Yajna tied Purusha as a Pasho. As a Pasho, it's a not literal translation. Tied him Pasho. Pasho, the one who has the Pashyati, the consciousness perception, who is charged with perception. So they spread him as a sacrifice with a fuel three times seven. And I was referring to already to this uh, in our grammatical class. Uh, these are seven karakas or seven vibhaktis with three different numbers, yes. which cover all possible relations, semantic relations in this manifestation. This was the fuel. <laughs> this was the, uh, the semantic uh, framework in which he could could be molded or could be put to work for this manifestation. Yajnena yajnam ayajanta devach. This is profound. This is the last verse. By yajna the God sacrificed yajna. These were the first laws. Tani dharmani prathamani asan. Tena Teha nakam mahimanach sachanta yatra purve sadhir santi devach. Those mighty ones indeed attain the heaven where the first sadhyas, again these mysterious sadhyas, and the gods dwell. Now, mm, jumping to Aitareya, Aitareya Upanishad with Sri translation is a longish text. I will take only one part of it, which is important to see the sacrifice. These are first three parts of the first uh, half. I'm looking at the time. So if you look at the Aitareya, uh, Shankaracharya says that the first three chapters are for the initiate. They are not for ordinary people. It's a secret knowledge. Um, let us read through it very fast. Atma va idam evagra asit nanyat kinchana mishat saikshata lokan nusrajayeti. In the beginning, the spirit was one. Atman was alone. And all this universe was him. There was nobody else. There was not else 
that saw. There was no other consciousness. The spirit thought, and it's interesting, sa ikshata. Ikshata means he saw, literally. And Mother says that on the highest level, when the spirit wills, he sees. He is not willing as we are willing. <laughs> he really envisions. When he sees, it is his will. It is activated when he sees. So, so it's very proper here. Saikshata, he saw. May I create the worlds. I will make me worlds from my own being. So I want to become the world, says it well. Saiman Lokana Srijata Ambho Marichir Maramapo Dombhav Parena Divam Dyav Pratishtanta Riksham Marichai Prithivi Maroya Dhastata Apaha. These were the worlds he made. Ambhas. Ambhas is the upper ethereal waters, upper supreme ocean. The transcendental ocean, as it were. Marichich, Marichich of light. I have to, I will skip, I will explain later if needed. Mara, the death, and the mortal things. Apach, the lower waters. So the one water became two oceans, the superconscient ocean and inconscient ocean. And in between, there was Marichi, which represent the upper ocean, the space, which represents the upper, and Mara, uh, the death, which represents the lower waters, Apos. So on both are from root Mari. It's interesting, Mari to die. Hmm? Marichi on one side and um, Mara on the other. Uh, and Diau, the heaven, Parena Divam, beyond the, these waters, the, uh, the heaven became the bottom. Pratishtha of the upper ocean. The heaven is the like a bottom for the upper ocean. When we see, when we look up into the heaven, we see the bottom of that swimming pool. Be beyond there is depth of the superconscient ocean. Uh, Antariksham Marichayach. And Marich is built Antariksham, the space between heaven and earth. Prithivi Maro. The, the earth became the death. Yad hastat, and that which is below earth, ta apa, and those are the inconscient ocean, ocean of inconscient waters. Now you, you see the first creation. The first creation was the habitat, the upper ocean, the lower ocean, the space in between, the uh, earth and heaven, heaven holding the upper ocean, earth holding the lower ocean, and in between there is this space in which we live. Saikshata imenu lokaha lokapalan nusrajaiti. And he thought, these are the worlds. May I create the dwellers within the worlds. Lokapala, it's like protector, but from root pa to fill in. The filler. The, those who f would fill, fulfill the worlds. Sodbhyaeva Purusham Samudritya Murchet, and he pulled from the lower waters the Purusha. This is something to think. Why from the lower waters, not from the higher waters? We have to discuss this later. So he pulled the Purusha and he gave him a shape. Amurchayat. He gave him shape and substance. Tam abhyatapatasya abhyatapatasya mukham nirabhidyata yathandam. And he concentrated on him all his energy, the heat, and his mouth broke forth, like the egg, yathandam, as egg cracks, his mouth cracked. Mukadvak from his uh, mouth speech, Vachognih from his speech, Agni was born. Nasike nerabhidyetam, his nostrils broke forth. Nasikabhyam pranach from, from the nostrils prana, the life energy. Pranadvayuch from the 
prana, vayu, wind, air was born. Akshinini rabhi dietam, his eyes broke forth. Akshibhyam chakshuh, from his eyes vision, seeing. Chakshusha adityach, from the seeing, the sun was born, the light. Karnauni rabhi dietam, his ears broke forth. Karnabhyam shrotram, from his ears hearing. Shrotrad dishach, from the hearing, the space came into being, the directions. Now notice that space, light, is the consequence of him hearing, seeing, not the other way around. He wanted to see the light came into being. He wanted to hear space was born. Not that space was there and then we developed some hearing, or the light was and then finally we developed the eye to see that light. No. He was, he was seeing and that's why light came into being. <laughs> so this is the, the first creation from the universal Purusha and so on. So one by one, first the, uh, the face, then the torso. His heart broke forth from the heart, uh, the... Uh, the mind from the mind, the moon, his navel broke forth from the navel, the apana breathing out, yeah? and from apana death, his uh, procreatory organ broke forth from there, the retas, the seed, and from the seed, low waters came into being. Those very lower waters from which he was drawn. There's much to think here, but he created these faculties. These faculties came out of him. These are the devatas which will create the worlds. And then, Taeta Devata Srishta and all these devatas being created, Asmin Mahatyarnave Prapatan fell or plunged into the inconscient ocean. It, it reminds me of the story of the mother, yes, how we all plunged into the inconscient ocean to redeem it and to bring it back to its self-awareness. So they plunged into this darker of waters. Tam ashana pipasa bhyam anvavarjat, and they were tormented there by hunger and thirst. A new concept, hunger and thirst. Um, I think it is lack of being and enjoyment. Yeah? It's some kind of lack of, of delight because there is no consciousness there. It's so narrow, so dark that uh, the, the, the divine cannot be, be aware of its own being. So it loses its awareness there. It forgets itself there loses its its uh, fullness of being, plenitude, and fullness of delight. These are the hunger and thirst, a lack of being and delight. Ta enama bruvan, and they cried to him, ayatanam naf prajanihi, create for us an uh, uh, abiding place, and a, a, a home, yeah, or the body, yasmin pratishthita annam adamehti, staying in which we can partake of food. Create for us a habitation that we may dwell secure and eat food. So they were exposed to this infinite inconscient ocean, these devatas, which plunged from the universal Purusha into the inconscient ocean. This is the sacrifice of Purusha. This is the Holocaust of the Divine Mother, as Shirbindo sp speaks somewhere about it. The faculties, the faculties which are totally aware of the universal being, were exposed to total loss of that being. And they cried to him, bring to us a possibility to become again what we are meant to be.
And he brought them the cow and they said, it's not enough for us. And then he brought them a horse and they said, it's not enough for us. And he brought them the Purusha, Ta Abruvan, and they spoke, Sukritam Bateti, it is well done. Purusha Vava Sukritam, Purusha is perfectly done, made. Ta Abravit, and he spoke to them, Yathayatanam Pravishateti, and to him is your habitation. And what happened next? Agnir Vak Bhutva, Agni having become the speech, the word, entered his mouth. Mukham Pravishat. Vayu Prano Bhutva, the wind, the air became the prana, the breathing in, and entered his nostrils. Aditya Shakshur Bhutva Kshini Pravishad. Aditya, the light, became the sight and entered his eyes. Dishak Shrotram Bhutva Karnau Pravishad. Pravishan. The dishas, the directions, became the hearing and entered his ears. And one by one they entered him. They reassembled the individual Purusha, the universal faculties reassembled the individual Purusha. This is how individual was created. We are all sharing the universal faculties of universal Purusha, thinking that it is our own seeing, our own thinking, our own feeling. And then, Tam ashana pipase abrutam, the uh, the hunger and thirst also cried to him. Avabhyama <laughs> bhiprajani, and for us you also create a place where we would also enjoy something. We can't stay in that form of lack of plenitude. Te abravit, and he spoke to them. Etasu. Eva vam devatasu, among these devatas, among these faculties, I make you the partakers or the sharers of their portion. Abhajami etasu bhaginiyau karomi iti, I make you the partakers of their portion within their own actions. Tasmad yasyei kasyei cha devatayei havir grihyate, therefore, if any offering is made to any of these devatas, bhaginyavasyam, in that devata there are these two partakers, uh, the hunger and thirst, take their portion also of that offering. So this is how he fulfilled the lack of, of that plenitude within the inconscient. Actually, it is by by feeding that hunger and thirst through offering and that hunger and thirst created i think in us the ego sense because our faculties now are searching and seeking constantly for self-satisfaction that's because of hunger and thirst they are constantly hungry and thirsty they always want to get more better vision better hearing better thinking better touch everything has to be the betterment is because of that inbuilt in them this hunger and thirst and also egoism comes from there that kind of self-consideration for one's own self-satisfaction <laughs> which wasn't there before and would not be there if these hunger and thirst would not join the party the universal of purusha could act very differently in that way but there would be no transformation of the of the inconscient ocean now chapter three tells us even more something about the form now, once that was created, they cried 
to to have the embodiment. Saikshata, and he thought, Imenu Lokaha, these are the worlds, the first creation, Loka Palan Palascha, and the the devatas which filled the creation and created these individual selves. Annam ebhyaks rajai hiti. May I bring or create for them the food, the embodiment, the body. So po bhyatapatta bhyo bhyatapta bhyo murti rajayata. And he heated up the lower waters and from those lower waters heated up the murti, the form came into being. Yavai samurti, that which is the form, ajayata, was born. Annam vaitat, that is indeed the matter or the food. It's interesting that in Sanskrit, food and matter is the same word. And actually it means eatable. Annam, it's a participle perfect passive voice from root ad to eat, eatable literally. So the matter plays this role of being constantly changing, yeah? mutating, transforming, eatable. It can be eaten up, uh, the, the energy can be released into another form. The form is constantly destructed on the way as it were. Tadenat srishtam parangat ya jighansa tadva cha jagrikshat tannashak no dva cha grahitum sayadhaina dva cha grahishyat abhivya ritya haivan namatrapsyat. Now, this is a very interesting passage, simple. I will translate it in a very simple way. So, it, it, once, once it was created, it wanted to escape and escape his embodiment, <laughs> him as the one who will partake of that food, enjoy it. Yeah? So he tried to catch it by the word, but couldn't catch it by the word, because if he would catch it by the word, by speaking about the food, we would already be satisfied by speaking of food. Tat pranena jigrekshatta nashak not pranena grahitum. He tried to catch it by prana, by breathing in, but he couldn't catch it by prana because if he could, then by simply breathing in, we would uh, be satisfied. A man be satisfied by merely breathing food. Tat chakshusha jigrekshat. He tried to catch it by sight, by seeing. So, if he would catch it by seeing, then a man would be satisfied by merely seeing the food. Some people try to do it, especially diabetics who cannot eat the, the chocolate and so on. So I remember one friend in Ashram invited us. He had all cakes and we sat and ate and then we asked him, why doesn't he join us with these cakes? He said, I am diabetic. <laughs> but he was watching us <laughs> eating so so happily. <laughs> so in some way, you can also enjoy that food <laughs> if somebody is eating. It's a joke. So he tried Shrotrena Jigrikshat. He tried to catch it by here and couldn't. It, Otherwise, a man would be satisfied by merely hearing about food. That's another joke uh, from India. Halva, halva. You know, when politicians come and s offer a lot of, you know, promises, people start shouting halva, halva. And I was thinking, why do they shout halva? And, and, and then somebody explained to me, halva means sweet, sweet. You say sweet, but I don't feel sweetness in the mouth. <laughs> So by speaking about food, we don't feel the sweetness. That's a very good joke. Halva, halva. Tatvacha uh, jagrikshat. He tried to catch it by by skin. Couldn't catch it by skin because by touching food we would be satisfied, and so on. By mind, by thinking, he couldn't. By even procreatory organ couldn't catch it, and then. He tried to catch it by breathing out. And he got it. 
by the apana he would have seized it and he and it was seized lo this is the seizer of food which is also breath of the life apana and you remember apana came from his navel and from apana death therefore all that is breath has its life in food it's it's a profound vision he could catch food only by death by killing it by destroying it there is no other way to catch it no way no other way to get that energy out of that uh, that uh, formation which we call matter the energy is within we want that energy we must destroy the form to get to the energy this is how everything functions in the world it it sounds a little bit like unfair but it is so it's how he created the world how he could embody himself in matter the spirit could embody himself only through death and then he thought katham vidam madrites yaditi how can it be without me saikshata he saw katarena prapadyaiti by what means by what way i can enter into this body Saikshata yadi vacha bhivya hritam, if by speech it is spoken, yadi pranena bhipranitam, if, if by breathing in it is breathed in, yadi chakshusha drishtam, if it is seen by the sight, yadi shrotrena shrutam, if it is heard by the hearing, yadi tvachas prishtam, if it is touched by the skin, yadi manasadhyatam, if it is thought by the mind, yadi yapanena bhyapanitam, if it is breathed out by the breathing out, yadi shishnena visrishtam, if it is procreated by procreatory organ, athakohamiti, then who am I? It's a profound question. <laughs> Suddenly he got bewildered. Who am I in all this? Look, it's done already by all these faculties. And where am I in all this? This is the profound question of Ramana Maharshi. Who am I? Who am I if it is all done? By hearing it is heard, by seeing it is seen, by, by skin it is touched, by the mind it is thought. Then where am I in all this? And here now a mysterious closure of this chapter. Sa etam eva simanam vidarya itayadvara prapadyata. And by cracking this siman, siman is this, um, what do you call it? The center of the head. Yeah? Vidarya, having, having cracked. The, the the middle of the head tayadvara prapadyata and by this door he entered saisha vidrirti nama dvastadeta nandanam and that is the named door or the portal by which he entered and it is called the blissful portal tasyatraya avasatrach he has three dwellings Swapna, Trayach Swapnach, and three dreams. Ayamavasatho, Yamavasatho, Yamavasatha, Iti. This is the dwelling, this is the dwelling, and this is the dwelling. We do not know what it means. It means most probably the teacher is showing to the students, speaking directly. I, I may stop here. There are, there are more exclamatory, very interesting of these, but time-wise we can stop here. This is the sacrifice of Purusha. The faculties of consciousness are projected into the inconscient and in evolutionary process rebuild the individual which possesses these universal faculties. So this is the recovery of the self through individual formation and evolution. That answers our question, what is the sacrifice? The consciousness is being sacrificed. There is no other sacrifice. 
Only the Divine was sacrificed here. Not me who is sacrificing here to the Divine. <laughs> That's what I thought when first time I thought about sacrifice. I am suffering, I am giving myself to you, and you do not fulfill my wishes, my commands, my desires, yeah? my good wishes. <laughs> I want good for everyone. <laughs> this is an egoistic claim of the sacrifice. Usually people understand it in this way. So, uh, Vladimir, how much uh, correlation do you see between the sacrifice uh, as um, the Rishis saw in the Rig Veda and this uh, Upanishad? I mean, clearly there is the original sacrifice of the divine, but after that, what, uh, what additional correlations, uh, if any, do you see between the two? Um. If you you have something in mind, please go ahead, because uh, yes, definitely the development, the whole evolution is taking place. Evolution is not this involutionary process which we read in this chapter. We saw the involutionary yeah, build up of the world and the evolution of finding the, the dwelling uh, individual formations of the, for these universal faculties. Of course, this is all only a framework in which we may th rethink the whole process of the sacrifice yeah um, in that sense every surrender is is what then is just return to 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 its divine prototype finding its right placing uh, placement and uh, time and space and uh, usage and application and that right which was never discovered yet so there is there is this novelty of of evolution which is it it's not repeating something which is already there yeah it it builds it up as it were it's a surprise for the divine himself though he knows himself totally still there is always a additional discovery or additional surprise or additional ananda being generated um, so that's why in the Isha Upanishad they say Isha Vasyam Idam Sarvam. All this is for habitation by the Lord. It's not yet inhabited by Him. It is to be inhabited by the, Him. And that takes time. And the Shubindu dedicates a lot of chapters for evolution and its tardy process of evolution. Why the study? Why it takes so long? Why it can't be faster? You know, because it's all, in a way, novelty. It's new. There is no world yet. We are the world in the making. It's not something we arrive at which is already made for us. We have to build it up. And this is an amazing thing if we, if we, if we think about. It. It's an amazing uh, view that we are making the world right now. And we can do any, we can move in any direction. We have the right at least. Of course, he may correlate that <laughs> by pralaya somewhere. <clears throat> I do not know. I am. I'm not sure that I'm even close coming to your question, but that's what comes to my mind to say what is new to that. What we, what is beyond this? What we read. What Sri Rubindo brings, and I think the evolution is what what is next. Evolution has to be understood in these terms, in the terms of involution. What was involved and what for? What is what our our purpose here is to recover the fallen self, to bring it back to its self awareness, and to bring it back. It means to build another world. They have to discover their own divine properties which are totally involved, hidden within. They have to unfold and discover those divine properties. 
with our help of this sacrifice. Yeah, makes sense, Radhe, or you want to, you meant something else. Well, I was trying to understand the correlation because in the Rig Veda, right, we have the sacrifice of Purusha being the breaking forth of his arms and his thighs and his his feet. And here we have the offering or the sacrifice coming manifestation coming from through the faculties of consciousness through his seeing and his you know ears and nose so it, it it's it's two different things it's both is um a breaking forth right of the parts of of the divine but it's interesting that one is through uh, and I know I'm I'm speaking uh, literally, and it's meant to be figuratively, but we can say the four powers of the of the mother. Yeah. Um, and the other is the faculties of of consciousness. Yeah. Um, so, why the difference um, in the explanation of what actually broke forth and uh, manifested creation? This is what I'm trying to. Uh, yeah, yeah. But if we look, if we look at the four parts of the Purusha as the body, we will see these very faculties, which Aitareya speaks in terms of faculties, like mouth is Brahmana, hands, feet. Uh, yeah, this is also again body-related parts, but uh, four powers of the mother is the very, the very essence of Purusha. Yeah? The very soul, as it were, such the substance. It, the yeah, the very the substance. Very substance of it. Such oh, it okay. ananda vijnana. These four major transcendental um, fences, as it were. Yeah, so there are seven fences which uh, they created. Um, so, in that sense, it's uh, just another mentioning or another pointing out of his transcendental. Uh, qualities and substance and values which was brought here and created these bodies, relations in knowledge, power, yeah, exchange, production and service, which are, again, it's another language which is ad adding to Aitareya, of course, because Aitareya is focused on devatas and mainly on consciousness, how consciousness is being uh, generated in this manifestation, yes doesn't go everywhere, it doesn't go into uh, seasons, it doesn't go into the one year as Purusha Suktam does. Yes? Uh, Purusha Suktam is broader framework. Yeah, it's a v valuable kind of notice to notice that, that they are not one-to-one -one explaining the same thing. They speak about the same thing in different languages. Aitare is closer to our mind, to our way of thinking, yeah? more psychological. This is more, I don't know, grand and philosophical and psychological and spiritual. And not very easy to understand, by the way. Uh, it is understood in religious terms and purusha uh, suktam, and usually interpreted very easily as four varnas and and so on. Great. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, today there was no time for uh, Gita. Mm. We took two big texts of sacrifice from Purusha Sukta and for, from uh, Aitareya. If you have something to say, some ideas, some thoughts or questions, please. It's time. We are already 10 minutes over time, so maybe we we'll take a little more if there are questions or something you want to share, some insights. Please share your insights. That's more interesting. Well, the, the only thing I, I will say, because it's sitting right there in, in front on, on your screen, is when you read by Yajna, the gods sacrificed Yajna, these were the first laws. And when you read that, I thought, oh, uh, Sri Aurobindo speaks of the sacrifice as, he may not say the first law, but it was the cosmic law, right? So this set into motion the whole cosmic law of sacrifice, of 
of offering, maybe not uh, surrendering, I still see on the individual level, but that every, everything consciously or unconsciously is therefore following this law of, of sacrifice, of offering back. Um, and so I just, I found it interesting that particular line referring to this sacrifice um, as creating the first laws and, and thinking back to Sri Aurobindo's comments of the cosmic law of sacrifice. Yeah, yeah. And it goes on when we looked into it the other day is that nothing here exists without the sacrifice. Everything gives to everything. And this is the way how everything exists. If, if suddenly some, you know, plants will stop giving their, you know, leaves or their flowers, that would be the end of the story. <laughs> everything gives everything to everything. And this is the beauty of it, you know, of this existence. Look how nature arranged everything, how beautifully it arranged. Nothing is a waste there. What, what, what a wisdom behind it, you know. Everything lives and and evolves and feeds on itself and is born. Is, is it not amazing, this kind of law of the sacrifice? But the form, as Aitareya says, tried to escape, tried to survive and couldn't because he caught it by death. By death he could catch the form and embody himself. This is the way how the, we try to escape death and <laughs> preserve the form. <laughs> but, but we can't yet. I have one observation, and I'm, my video keeps freezing up, but um, I don't, yes. I don't think I, if there's an answer for it in the amount of time, but it, it we talked about sacrifice and surrender and I noticed myself, I've had this insecure feeling and, and I took a deep breath and it's like, whenever I want to relax, it seems like I, I have to just breathe. And so I initially it came up with me as a, uh, you know, the prana, you know, am I being breathed? Am I breathing? Well, you know what it, and, uh, and so I, I set out to look for prana being talked about tonight. And it, interestingly, it eluded me. So, um so i'm going to keep looking for that over the next oh, yeah we can we can discuss prana next time maybe because yeah, this is the way breathing in and breathing out this is the foundation of life yes what is this life about being born and dying perpetually dying and that means living thank you thank you very much mm. yes thank you Great, then uh, if no more, no more, uh, Nishat, so you're very serious, uh, so to say, thinking uh, silently. No, I'm not thinking at all. No? <laughs> Thoughts stopped moving, yeah? Again, froze. It's a good sign when thinking is not troubling us, I guess. You have some thoughts, Nishat, or no? Some... Well, I have I have some thoughts, but they're not related to what we discussed today. My my real concern is um, so we all came to Sri Aurobindo and the mother by who knows um, by whatever means that we came to them in this life. Are we going to also have the same kind of grace in you know future lifetimes? after we pass away and how is that determined is there is there any way of knowing we will come back to this integral yoga or to the mother's grace again yeah yeah it depends on us i think on what we choose we have freedom to but i think their path is central for every other path so I don't see much of uh, of a choice uh, going elsewhere. <laughs> Wherever you go, there will be that central integral path. Mm. At least as I understand it today. Mm. Deviating from it to some kind of uh, 
smaller path like Advaitic or any other, you know, uh, it is not possible anymore. Once you know the truth, it's very difficult to to go elsewhere. You can incorporate everything, yes, but to to change it for something lesser, smaller, uh, more particular, I am not sure whether it is even doable. Okay. Yeah. It's not that they are some some path against others. I think they are just the path of which incorporates all other paths, for, gives them the right perspective and place placement, so we can being on any path, we will be on their path. Yeah. All right. Okay. Then I close with the mantra for today. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santo Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makaschit Dukha Bhag Bhavet Om Shanti 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 Adio. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you. See Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.